Hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar on Digital Tools for Farmers Advisory and Climate Action. It's great to see people starting to sign in. Um, we can just give a minute more for others to start signing in. So we can. Perfect. I'm starting to see people signing in. Thank you very much. Um, so let's start. So before we get started, I want to make sure that you all can see us and hear us okay. So if you can see us and hear us okay, please let us know by typing that in the chat box. Thank you, yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so everyone, my name is Maria Camila Gomez and I am the project administrator of the Community of Practice on Data-Driven Agronomy. I am here as the host of this webinar and which is under the umbrella of the Community of Practice. So as we are here, um, because as the Community of Practice, um, one of the objectives that we have is to facilitate and communicate collective action on a particular topic across the CGIR and its big data and agriculture partners. So this is precisely what we want to show and do today in this webinar. We want to bring um, virtually our colleagues to share their experiences on two digital tools that help farmers adopt climate smart agricultural practices and the lessons learned from a user interface design from with farmers in Uganda. So in terms of the dynamics of today's webinar, we will start with Sarah, um, which is the climate smart agriculture program leader Diana will jump right in and continue the presentation. Later, Anton, a climate change scientist at the Alliance of Biodiversity International and SIAT, will jump in and we will finalize the presentation with our PhD candidate, Mona. So remember that if you have any questions along the presentations, remember to start writing them down on the Q&A box you have below and our panelists will be answering your questions at the end of the webinar. So. Let's get started. Um, so Sarah, let's jump right into you. Thank you. Let me share my screen here with you. And thank you very much, Siat, for inviting us to, to share our learning in this forum. So I just want to give a little bit of a, an overview quickly of the Climate Smart Agricultural Program in Uganda. Um, we are part of IITA, and I think most people know IITA. Um, we, we sit under the Tanzania uh, Eastern, IITA Eastern Hub, um, and our program fits within the Natural Resource Management and Climate Change uh, Directorate of IITA. The objective of the Climate Smart Program is, is to enhance smallholder farmer resilience and livelihoods. Uh, resilience to climate change and, and to improve farmer livelihoods. Um, the program uh, cuts across Uganda and, and Ghana um, and we, we do this through co-designing and, and testing uh, climate smart technologies with public and private sector partners. Um, so over a period of years, actually in coffee in Uganda, uh, Uganda uh, IITA has been researching in coffee in Uganda from 2006, uh, but this project timeline is specific to the development, uh, the co-design and the development of these climate smart technologies. Um, so you can see there's various projects that have taken place, um, different funding streams have taken, you know, over the last um, number of years around three particular themes, biophysical research, socioeconomic uh, systems research, and policy and institutional uh, environment research. These are our partners or some of our partners. Um, so basically we work in the public private sector um, 
space. In Uganda, we have a very active public private sector platform, coffee platform. Um, so we have very active engagement in Uganda with private sector um, around the development of technologies. Our, the technologies we have designed in Uganda include uh, land use planning, uh, farmer segmentation, and stepwise. Um, and essentially the three go together. We work with different private sector partners on different levels, of course, so sometimes we may actually do just one of, of, of any of these technologies um, with that particular partner, depending on where they are in their, in their, um, in their operations. Um, but essentially we like to do these three together. So we do a land use mapping basically of the area to understand the ecological um, variations, the, the existing players in the field, what the opportunities are. Um, we then do a farmer segmentation, which, which basically looks at the community and looks at the different farmer typologies within a specific community or larger group. And then we de design a site specific, what has come to be known as stepwise, which is actually climate smart investment pathways for, for smallholder coffee farmers. Um, this this um, illustration look, is specific to coffee in Uganda, but a similar stepwise was developed also with uh, cocoa farmers in, with IATA in Ghana. It's applied slightly differently, of course, because of the variations. Um, so here we're just looking at, at coffee. The decision support tools that Diana, my colleague, is going to present, um, then these are specific to, to Uganda. They, they have been developed around coffee in Uganda. Uh, the stepwise application um, takes uh, an extension worker through the stepwise approach. Um, the Shade Tree Advice smartphone application is, is looking specifically at, at Shade, obviously, and this is a collaboration with, with ICRAF and, and CRAD. So the key results in coffee that we found from, the, from applying these climate smart technologies, um, we're seeing some significant um, gain, yield gains, uh, so up to 73% in, in Mount Elgin, where we're working with Olam. Um, we are seeing good adoption rates of agricultural and, and climate smart agricultural practices as a result of working with private sector in, uh, with Stepwise. Um, and preliminary results have shown uh, reduced incidence in pest and disease as well. So the overall program success, uh, our, our program successes include GIZ showcasing of the Stepwise smartphone application. Um, they, they saw it as one of their key innovations. Sorry. Uh, in terms of the approach, um, private sector are already scaling this approach. We are moving as a project or as a, an institution, we're moving into a scaling phase now. Um, but we've already found that Olam, given the success of the work we've done with Olam in Mount Elgin uh, around the climate smart technologies, Olam is already um, scaling the stepwise approach. Um, the, vice, the vice president of Olam actually said that he believes that this the learning from working with IITA and CGIA partners on this project um, has changed the way Olam actually works with its farmers. We've also seen the stepwise approach incorporated into the coffee and climate toolkit, which is a global toolkit. Um, we've seen the public sector uh, include the stepwise approach and the farmer segmentation approach in the Uganda coffee roadmap, which was um, which is a, a new policy for, for Uganda's ambitious target of 20 million bags of coffee uh, exports by 2025. And we have incorporated the, the learning also into the Uganda Coffee Development Authority Arabica uh, and Robusta handbooks. Um, these are technical handbooks for, um, for the extension workers. Similarly in Ghana, although I'm not presenting on Ghana here, but similarly in Ghana, we, we have seen um, uh, similar successes with Stepwise. Um, there was also a very active public private sector space in Ghana where, where the Stepwise approach was, was, um, was developed. 
and Ghana is going on to develop a stepwise application as well to support the, the rollout of it. Our next steps then moving into scaling, um, we're introducing a living, a living income lens to our stepwise approach. So looking beyond just coffee and, and, and a coffee farmer, looking at the household level, how, how, um, how we can increase living income to, to that uh, household. But again, using a stepwise approach. We're reinforcing our existing private sector partnerships, but we're also identifying new partnerships so that we can scale uh, all of our technologies, uh, which hopefully will include the decision tools, the ICT decision tools. We'll be expanding geographically in Uganda um, from about nine districts up to 17, maybe more districts. Uh, we're increasing our capacity building around the development of these technologies and the strengthening of the technologies. Um, so we're bringing in more PhD and, and MSc students into a new scaling project. And then we're increasing the dissemination of results and learning through the development of, of dynamic communication methodologies. Um, so we're looking at how do we link our existing smartphone extension tools now to mobile phone platforms um, because farmers don't necessarily have access in Uganda to the smartphone um, platforms. Um, those are, are very much the, the, for the technical uh, extension staff. But there is opportunity, of course, to, to link the smartphone and mobile platforms. So that's a, an exciting new um, part of our scaling. So that's a brief introduction to the project. And I want to hand over to Diana, who will go into a little bit more detail about the tools. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I will take on from Sarah. Let me just find my presentation. Um, can you see it? Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. I will take on from Sarah. She has already introduced the ICT decision support tools that we have developed under IITA. And I'll take you through briefly through the two main tools. Um, the first tool I'll present is the stepwise smartphone application. As Sarah already introduced it, I'll go in detail. And then I'll go to the shared tree advice smartphone application. Um, yeah, so we developed the stepwise smartphone application. Um, from what we call the stepwise investment pathway, what we currently call stepwise, as Sarah introduced. So stepwise was an approach where we broke down the climate smart agricultural practices into smaller packages for smallholder, um, smallholder coffee farmers who cannot afford implementing all the practices at once. So through the stepwise approach, this breaks down the, the whole packet, the whole bundle of practices into step-by-step -step practices that farmers can implement incrementally. As you realize on the on the left hand side in the figure, so we have the step one that gives the basic management practices. We usually have like weeding and pruning and suckering, and then we move into step two, which has mostly the cultural control of pests and diseases. Then we have step three, which is also a combination of step one, step two practices and enhancement of soil fertility and water retention. So we have practices like um, um, digging trenches, like um, adding um, manure, organic manure, and then we move to step four, which is the intensification using pesticides and inorganic fertilizers. So um, as you realize, you move along the different steps. You move from step one, basic practices, step two, you add step one to additional practices. And as you move up the, the stairs, the staircase, you realize an increment in yield and a need for more investment. So this was developed um, with the national stakeholders, as well as site-specific uh, stakeholders in different parts of the country for Arabica and Robusta. So we developed a stepwise investment pathway for Arabica coffee and one for Robusta coffee. And uh, yeah, so we integrated this into an application, which I am going to. And uh, yeah, so far our coverage, we have covered Luero districts, Rakai, and So this is how the application looks like. This is looks like the stepwise. So this is a video. Right now, it's not active. I'll just explain. So the video just explains what stepwise is, the importance, and how an extension worker can use the stepwise application, smartphone application to take a farmer through. 
then in uh, the next, uh, um, the next is uh, the steps that you see step one, step two, step three, and step four. So ideally, the extension worker would take uh, the smallholder farmer through um, through the application by asking, taking him through the different steps. So you will realize that maybe certain farmers would be at different levels in the steps because they're implementing the climate smart agriculture practices differently. So in the step one, of course, it's the basic practices. So you ideally want to know if a farmer is implementing all the basic practices or he has some basic practices that he's missing and then the extension worker would be able to advise the farmer. So maybe in step one, it would, um, when you click step one, it's the first question that pops up would be, do you weed your coffee? Because that's the most basic practice in coffee management. And then the farmer would respond yes or no. In case he's doing his weeding coffee, then it will take him to the other practice within step one that he's supposed to implement in his coffee. In case the farmer is not implementing a particular practice, for example, if he's not weeding his coffee, then within the application, the next step would be to take, would be that the extension worker guides the farmer to the weeding practice, shows him how it's done, how often it is done, and the benefits of that practice. So that's how, that's the layout of the application. And ideally, it would be used by the smallholder, by the extension worker to guide the farmer and also to monitor their farmers so that you know if your farmers have moved from step one, then you should be guiding them into the next step with um, minimal investment and, and um, like practices that they can easily do. So if farmers, your farmer implements step one and step two practices, then the role of the extension worker is to encourage the farmer to move into the step three practices and yeah, explain the benefits to him until he goes to the fourth step, which is the intensification step and the highest um, step where you realize the highest yields. Okay, so I'm done with a stepwise smartphone application. Um, yeah, currently we have most uh, information for Uganda, as I explained in the geographic coverage, but we hope to populate this tool with more information from other sites. And also in Uganda, we hope to scale out to other parts of, of the country, as Sarah already explained, that we will move from the nine districts that we have covered and also move to more districts and also include more information into the application so that extension workers in different parts of the country can be able to guide different smallholder farmers into investing in coffee in a stepwise way. The second tool is the Shed Tree smartphone application. This was also developed um, for the benefit of the farmer, but it is uh, it's an application that is used by the extension workers. So we realized that in the coffee system in Uganda, most farmers um, have different trees planted together with their coffee. And some of the, these trees have, of course, benefits and also the negative side, that are the negative uh, the disadvantages they create in the coffee garden. So we realize that it's important to develop an application that can guide smallholder farmers on what type of trees they can plant with their coffee. So we know that um, trees have different uses, different ecosystem services. Those were taken into consideration in the development of the app. So, for example, we took uh, benefits like provision of food, provision of uh, firewood, timber, ability of trees to recycle nutrients, controlling erosion, controlling temperature, soil moisture, and suppression of weeds. So our aim is to ensure that um, smallholder farmers only plant those trees that are um, beneficial to their coffee gardens, but also provide additional benefits, other benefits to the farmers. So we don't want farmers to be planting trees that um, may be alternative hosts to coffee pests and diseases, or trees that are competing for nutrient and water with their coffee. So we developed this application. So the tool was developed based on local knowledge. I'm going to explain how, um, and we took into consideration various functions that trees provide, and it's tailored to end user priorities. So it's based on what the farmer wants. It's user friendly and it is free. So, and it's extendable to other parts of the country. Um, currently in the Shed Tree Smartphone application, advice smartphone application, we have three regions that we have covered in the country, Eastern, which is represented by the Mount Ogon area. In Central region, we have data represented by Greater Luero. And then in Northern Uganda, we have covered Gulu, Ira, Oyam, Noya, and Apache, which are already
So the methodology that we used towards developing the application, we started with a shed tree inventory. In the inventory, the aim is to find out the different species of trees that are in a particular area, because we go to a particular area and we find a lot of trees. So the aim of the inventory is to know the tree diversity in a particular area. Then after the inventory, we picked out 20 most abundant trees through the analysis. And uh, out of those 20 trees, we, took, we went back to the smallholder farmers and were able to conduct a shed tree ranking survey. So during the ranking survey, the smallholder farmers themselves, so it was mostly with the smallholder farmers and also extension workers in specific sites. So they rank the trees. Um, out of the 20 trees that we get from the inventory after the analysis, the farmers are able to are supposed to rank them, are taken through a, a process where they rank those trees based on different ecosystem services, as I explained, things to do with providing shade to coffee, recycling nutrients, um, controlling temperature, all those benefits, providing food, timber, firewood. So we balanced all those ecosystem services. So we had 12 ecosystem services and 20 shed trees, abundant, most abundant shed trees from different, from each site. Out of that, we later developed the web-based application so the shed tree web-based application, which is available online. And um, I'm going to explain how that works. And later we realized that um, small, after, after testing and pre-testing and validating the web-based application, it came out that um, most of our smallholder farmers in the country, one, don't have, com uh, sorry, um, extension workers who are the users of this tool, don't usually have computers. And most times when they're in the field, they don't have access to internet. So we decided to develop the, the shed tree advice looks like. So ideally with all the information, I, as I explained, we collect information from, from particular specific sites and it's what we feed in the application for that specific site. So it's context, it has information that is context. The layout of the shed tree affects my phone application. Look Sorry, like Diana, we're sort of losing your connection. So if you can just provide a quick recap of what you just said before. Uh, okay, let me just go back. Yeah, I can see it's telling me that the network is, my connection is poor. Can I just turn off the video maybe? Yeah, so I'm moving into the Shetree smartphone application and I was explaining why we developed the smartphone application. It's to enable the extension workers access the tool, even if they're in the field and they don't have good internet connectivity and they don't have laptops, they can still have it on the yeah, it will be free. So this is what the application looks like. Oof. Hello? Hello? Yeah, we sort of have um, we can't list, we can't hear you very well, but um, yeah, let, let's try to continue to see. And if not, um, we can we can answer some questions at the end of the of the web, of the webinar. Okay. So can I continue? I'm just not able to scroll to the next slide. Yeah, you can continue, Diana. I think we hear you good now. Okay. So the screen is stuck. I'm not able to move to the next slide. Just a minute. I'm not sure what happened. Yeah, now we can see your screen. You just shared your screen again. Okay, yes. Okay, let me just... Uh, Okay, so I'm done with the methodology and I emphasize that we used local knowledge and all the information we have in the application is based on local information provided from the different contexts. So this is the layout. So you start with, the inform it gives you um, information about the shed tree advice tool, then it takes you into the ranking of the shed trees and then a tree library where you provide more, where there is more information about each tree. So with the layouts, one, the farmer, the extension worker takes the farmer through selecting where he is, his particular site. For example, if it's in Eastern Uganda, it's based on altitude. 
the high, medium, and low altitude. And then um, next, um, you get the extension worker guides the farmer into selecting and ranking his most um, important attributes that he's interested in when it comes to trees. So it could be mulch, it could be yield, it could be erosion, and those he gives particular, he gives weight, so up to five. So uh, um, an attribute that is given a weight of five is the most important to the farmer. And then a weight of four is the next, the third is three is the third, and then the second. So with this, finally, we get the, the shared tree advice. So assuming this is how the farmer's preference would look like, the highest strength, if it was mulch, would have the highest weight and then temperature and then erosion. Assuming the farmer had selected one attribute, this is how, what the tree advice would look like. So from that, the tool would be able to generate particular, up to three trees, specific trees that would provide that the most, the most, the most um, that particular benefit. So if it was soil moisture, the tree the, from the up, you're able to get the trees that are the best in providing soil moisture. For example, it would be ficus mucosa, which would be the first, and then albizia, and then ficus natalensis. So it's up to the farmer to pick out of these three trees. So yeah, the, advi the shared tree advice tool would filter out those trees that are not important for that particular benefit. And then the extension marker would recommend what the trees that come from the advice tool to the farmer. Then we have the tree library, which looks like this on the right hand side. In the tree library, we have the, the picture of the tree, the leaves and the fruit, so that the farmer is, is um, um, the farmer knows the particular tree that he's talking about, that he has selected, and then additional information for the to guide extension workers to be able to provide recommendations to the farmer. Yes, I've presented the two tools, the Shared Tree Smartphone application, as well as the stepwise, um, stepwise application. So we have the next steps in developing these tools. One is uh, collaborating with uh, other CGIAR partners, which we're doing right now, with uh, SEAT, ECRAF, and ECRAF, and uh, CIRAD. Sorry, not SEAT, CIRAD. And yeah, we are working towards having one web-based uh, uh, Shared Tree Advice tool which is accessible for the public. And then we also hope to populate the tools with data from new sites so that we have a wider coverage and also we can, it can, the tools benefit more farmers and can be utilized by more extension workers. We're also looking towards synchronizing the two tools. Um, as you know, the shed tree step, planting shed trees or management of shed trees is one of the climate smart agriculture practices within the stepwise investment pathway. So we are going to have an additional layer where we link the shed tree management practice to the shed tree tool so that when a, an extension worker is going through, he can be able to move to that particular, um, to the tool and be able to give the recommendations when it comes to shed tree to the smallholder farmers. Then we'll also be validating the tools with private and public sector extension workers. We have done a pretest already and we've gotten positive feedback, but we want to do a final validation after synchronizing these two tools, and then we launch the tools for public use and make them available. And then we will also be identifying opportunities to link these tools with other tools, with other mobile platforms, and be able to make these tools more public. Yes, Maria, I'm done. I hope I was clear. Perfect, thank you, thank you. All right, <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, I just had a last slide, but I think it's okay. It's about my, it's my contact and, um, my contact and, yeah, and any questions, but I think that can come later. So that was, those were my last two slides. Perfect. I'll share your contact info through the chat box and any questions right. that any of the attendees have, you can start writing them down in the Q&A box. Thank you, Diana. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, I'm the next one. So my name is Anton Eitzinger. I'm from the Alliance Biodiversity International in SEAT. I will present the GeoPharma app. This is an app that we have developed uh, within the project that we did together with, um, with IITA for the last three years, uh, funded by BMZ. Uh, but we, also, we already started this devel developing this app before, so there's several projects or several funding uh, that we use to, to develop this app. So, 
So what is the basic concept of Geopharma that we developed at the beginning? Uh, so it's, we wanted to have an interactive two-way feedback between farmers and experts, so using digital tools for it, uh, doing a geolocated data collection, so this includes surveys, collecting field points and, and working on, on kind of discussion platforms with farmers. And then farmers can communicate with experts while doing experiments in the field, by testing new practices, for example. So this was the basic concept that we designed. This was back in, I think it was 2014 or 2013, I don't remember, uh, where we started thinking about how we can use digital tools for, for climate change um, adaptation and implementation of climate smart agriculture practices. So what we, what we have developed so far, a user story for, for using GeoPharma, so it's basically, if you have a farmer, like let's say it's a coffee farmer in Colombia, and, and she loves to talk to other coffee farmers about new practices, but she doesn't often get access to good advisory services. So she, she joins basically this virtual community channel in GeoPharma, which is called, for example, the coffee farmers in Colombia. And she starts publishing her questions that she has about coffee uh, growing. And she gets answers from other farmers, but also from experts, like she gets normally from extension service. And after she's using the application for a while, she can even participate in scientific, in science projects, like the one we do with, uh, with the climate change program, CCAFs, when we do to implement together with farmers, uh, climate smart agriculture practices. So she can provide feedback through service, and this is all connected in this one communication channel where she can find all the information in one single place. So we start, when we started developing the first version of GeoPharma, it was, by then it was called CSA Implementer. Uh, we started in Tanzania and we used uh, a very common approach for citizen participation, which has been developed by the University of Salzburg. And it's called the GeoCitizen approach. And we translated this approach for farming or for agriculture. So we realized very quick that our that we have end users and next users are very important. Next users are the technicians, extension workers, that are the ones that are using the, the application at the beginning, because as also Sarah mentioned at the beginning, most smallholder farmers won't have smartphones, so they they won't need support from 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 others or from extension workers to get access to this tool, so to get access to the information. So we designed this tool as a as a tool that can be used by what we called facilitators. Facilitators are, could be used in the, in the local village or could be an extension worker who is using GeoPharma and is going to farmers. He's doing interviews with farmers or is showing farmers uh, practices on the, on the smartphone app. And this is the way how we, we started this interactive feedback between farmers and outside experts uh, while implementing climate smart agriculture practices. So this was done first in Tanzania and then we moved to Uganda and then we joined uh, with Sarah and Diana the BMZ project and we further developed it uh, through the last three years to the current version of GeoPharma which includes all this functionality. So it's an ICT based platform for real-time delivery and monitoring for CSA package implementation but it could, could also be used for any other agriculture practice crowdsourcing, two-way feedback, including farmers and expert facilitators. So two-way feedback is very important. So we, we, we wanted to, to find a way that, that the information is not just going in one direction, like from, from, from as an advisory recommendation down to the farmer. So we wanted to find ways how we can collect feedback and get information back from farmers through the same application or through the same uh, channel and, and, and make it a two-way communication. This is one of the very crucial parts of, of GeoPharma, which maybe makes it different to other apps that are sometimes just pure data collection apps. So what are the basic uh, functionalities or the basic, um, yeah, the basic uh, steps I, I will explain in the next few slides. Uh, so, so it's based on channels. So we, we create this uh, project, project like structure that we call channels where farmers go or extension workers go and they are together in this space. We have different user roles. I will also explain later what different roles we use in GeoPharma. And also there are functions and they are organized in modules. So we have different modules that can be used um, uh, in the GeoPharma app. So looking at the channel, so what is a channel? A channel is a 
as I said, like it's a project-like structure for a geographic area or for, uh, for, for a theme. So it could be for coffee farmers, it could be for coffee farmers in Uganda, but it could be for coffee farmers worldwide. So we organize these channels like on geographical units and also on content. And if a farmer goes or if a user first goes to the app, um, it will show him his closest geographical channel uh, first. So you can see I'm in Bogota currently. And I will see like the, the closest channel to me is in Boyacá. Then there are some other channels in Latin America. And on the second row, you will see channels from Africa because they are far away from, from here. So they're not relevant for me at this, at this geographical location. And then even far away, I get channels from Asia. So if a, if a user goes to the GeoPharma platform, he will first see a lot of channels, but he will see the most relevant ones for him first. And he can subscribe to these channels. And then he will be only in his channel, which is relevant for him. And, and he's interacting in this, in this one uh, relevant channel. So what are different user roles? So we have user, normal users. It could be a farmer, could be extension worker. Um, and then we have the facilitators. As I explained before, they are very important because they are uh, supporting the normal users using the GeoPharma app by doing interviews through service, for example. And then there's the moderator which is kind of the responsible person for the channel. So he can create new service in the channel. He can manage the service. He can also, he's moderating the discussion and he's kind of the, 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 the role with most functionalities. So he is basically the manager of a channel. So, and, and every user can have all of these three roles in different channels. So he can be a, a normal user in one channel and a moderator in another channel. So this is kind of how we manage the different um, channels in GeoPharma. And then uh, looking at the different uh, modules and functionalities. So I, there's one, the basic uh, mo module that we developed first, which is maybe the most used until now, is the survey module. Uh, we have it used very extensively through facilitators. So fac facilitators are going through a farm and doing an interview with a farmer and filling a survey. They can see the survey results immediately after finishing the survey. And, and yeah, we have several facilitators collecting data at the same time. They can collect it offline, obviously. And, uh, and then they share the data, the results go into this common channel and everybody can see the, the results after finishing. A second module, which is the, the basic module of GeoPharma or the basic module of, of the GeoCitizen framework we use is the collaboration module. Here it's mostly about peer-to-peer -peer knowledge sharing. So a user can ask questions, he can respond to questions from others, he can add ideas, issues, and all this is organized in, 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 an, in a discussion timeline. So every user can go there and kind of learn from other users a specific practice which is relevant for this channel. Let's say the coffee farmers in Colombia are discussing about um, about the coffee pest or the example I'm showing here is you could, you could, you could even use the content that we've just seen from Diana's presentation in the Stepwise app and put it here or put links to the Stepwise app here and then have a discussion and questions from farmers uh, in this discussion uh, module. And then there are some other modules. I will not go into the detail because of time. We don't have enough time to go into all, in all the modules. So there's obviously a very important module is the is, uh, geographical information like maps, Mona. will explain later a little bit more about the maps. We have also developed a farm calculator where we can create worksheets of, of data we want to collect at the farm level and then the facilitator goes and just collects the data and, and can calculate indicators uh, in real time out of the collected data and he will see the results uh, in, in the farm calculator. Like for example, cost and uh, uh, yeah, uh, spendings and, and incomes on a specific crop and you can get like the total um, difference between uh, spendings and, and income after finishing the farm calculator. And then we also have push notifications so you can send notifications to all users that are subscribed to the channel. Okay, so then one quick example how we used it very successfully through the last three years. So we, together with CCAFs, we worked on an indicator framework for climate smart villages. So CCAFs is implementing on yeah, 
I think it's more than 20 climate smart villages globally where they test and, and train farmers on climate smart agriculture. And, and we are collecting indicators through GeoPharma on the farm performance, household indicators, and um, at the community level, like perceptions about CSA practices. And this all goes into standard defined indicators and you get very uh, quick results on the GeoPharma app after finishing the service about these indicators. Uh, also very important component of GeoPharma that we did this in the CCAFS project was capacity building. So we, we, we went like to more than 11 countries and we did trainings and local capacity building with the facilitators to use the GeoPharma app. So this basically was structured in a one week workshop where they learn about the app, then they, they learn about the indicator questions and then they we do testing and they go out to the field and they start data collection. But we have also developed uh, this year now our first online learning courses for GeoPharma because uh, there's a first course called this Introduction to GeoPharma. So it, you, you can access it at the big data platform, but also at, at a, a Moodle platform that we have installed on the SEAD web page. So you can easily learn by your own how to use GeoPharma. And, and so it's kind of in the future, it will replace our, on, on our, our capacity building and, and workshops that we do in the countries, we can replace them by step-by-step uh, step, changing them to online uh, learning courses. So if you need more information, this is, that's all for now because we have, uh, we have one more presentation from Mona. Uh, if you need, if you want to learn more about GeoPharma, you can go to the online courses or you can go to the, our landing page or our web page or you can send me an email. Okay, I'm gonna hand over to Mona now. Mm -hmm. Hi everybody, I think you see my screen now. Um, so thanks Anton, um, my name is Mona Bartling. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Salzburg at the um, Geoinformatics Department. So as Anton said, I'm more focusing on geospatial data and how to visualize uh, them. And for this part of the, um, of the webinar, I'm not so much uh, talking about the concept, so that um, was Anton's part, um, explaining the concept uh, of the geopharma, but a bit more about what we have, have to take into, ac into account in terms of interface design. And this is especially um, relevant uh, since, as, as Anton explained, we are moving more and more towards uh, working directly with farmers. So we have a much broader user audience now with those farmers that need different things, obviously. And uh, Diana actually mentioned, mentioned that for her tools or for their tools, that user friendliness is, of course, uh, something important, um, especially um, in regard to making sure that uh, farmers or users in general will use the application long term. So. Uh, making user-friendly interfaces sounds easy, but I think um, it can be very complicated, especially if you have lots of functionalities and stuff like that. And also what means user-friendliness and who is the user? And those are all considerations to take into account. And I think we, um, in, in particular towards the farmers, we can learn much more about them. And I think um, we are going to work more and more with farmers directly in the future because there will have to be more accessibility towards the smartphone, uh, smartphones and applications, I, I would assume. So that is why it is important to focus also on the inter interface design and evalu evaluating those uh, interface design decisions. So a little bit like to conceptualize this, um, when we when I talk about the user, usually we touch um, on the concepts of user-centered design. Um, and then we hear those terms like usability and user experience. I think everybody has heard about this um, because this is, those are concepts that are actually broad, like for any product interface application, um, they are used those terms. Um, what does it mean? Um, for usability, it could mean that um, we have to respond to the question, how can we make a usable and intuitive app? And for user experience, which broadens this usability term, um, the question would be, how can we make a joyful and satisfactory app? 
So um, the user experience part is, is important for long-term um, participation of the user, which we want in those collaborative um, applications. Then we have um, this little bit of a problem, which is called usability utility trade-off. At least in my opinion, that's a, that's a bit tricky to tackle. So we have those different users. So we have a broad user audience usually, um, and we have a certain set of functionalities. That's the utility part. And we want to make sure um, that the interface or the application is still usable enough. So for some users, this range of, of functionalities might be too much. For others, it's not enough. Um, but uh, for those users that, ha that, want uh, that want only the basic range of functionalities, then having lots of, lots of more functionalities in there um, might reduce their usability. So we have to find a common denom denominator between all the users. So that's the trade-off. We have to find kind of a balance, a compromise. Um, and this, this is the case when we talk about one size fits all um, interfaces or applications. So we have just one interface for everybody. Um, in contrast to that, we can have, or we could establish interface personalizations. So meaning we look at the users and user types or user situations. And then we can make um, specific and individual decisions uh, about how the interface should look like. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about that part. Um, this is more part uh, from my, uh, in my PhD. I think it is important to have a look at that um, because uh, this we need to take into account for this trade-off uh, aspect. Um, what we also were we're talking about um, th those. The, our, our team around the geopharma um, is how much do we have to simplify? Um, what kind of functionalities, uh, functionalities can we provide so everybody can um, make sense of, of them? And then for me specifically, since I'm coming from this geospatial perspective and uh, visualization perspective, um, can we use advanced features such as maps and how do they have to look like? So which kind of features can we add? What kind of types of maps? For which user type and use case that we um, have this personalization uh, going on again, and how do we have to design these features in general, and how um, can we respond these, to these questions? We have to test these, um, or yeah, with with the end user. So usually, what what um, uh, product designers, uh, interface designers do, they um, go into the field and do empirical studies. This is what we what we've done last year in Uganda and in Colombia with coffee farmers. It was a quantitative study. We had a survey um, with 70, uh, 72 participants in total. Um, and what we were looking at was um, how um, we were interested, first of all, in the participants' characteristics to understand a little bit more who they are as users. And then we wanted to understand how these characteristics characteristics relate to the success rate. So that's the usability part, uh, the comfort and confidence, that's the user experience part. And then what we did was we provided those participants different map interface designs uh, to test these differences. Um, we in total had 27 of these uh, map interface designs and uh, we gave each participant only 12, a subset and randomized subset. Uh, so it wasn't in between um, subject and study design or survey design. I'm not going to talk too much about this now. So the questions we, we asked um, were first of all those, those profile questions to understand the user. There was um, about demographics, smartphone and map use experience. And then we um, prepared 27 different map interfaces, um, as I said. And these 27 different interfaces were a combination of three different tasks. There was identification of a location, you see that on the right, selecting a point on the map and sketching on the map. Then we had three different base map styles where we only showed landmarks and primary net, uh, road network. So very reduced version of a base map. Um, then we showed a simplified base map where we showed a little bit more street networks so or a little bit more context information for the map and those highlighted point of interests. And then we showed the, um, a Street View base map, which we know from Google Street View, for example. For all of these base maps, we used uh, Mapbox. So some of you know, may, might know Mapbox. Um, and then we, have three, we had three different degrees of interactivity. There was a static map, um, so the user wasn't, um, or the participants weren't able to, to move the, the map at all, to interact at all. 
or to, to yeah, pan and zoom. Then the second degree was um, a restricted zooming and panning. So we basically had a bounding box um, where the participants were able to move in this bounding box. And that was relevant. So they weren't able to jump out of this and go, I don't know, somewhere else to the Pacific Ocean. And then the third version was uh, the non-restricted version. So the user was, uh, or the participants were able to move uh, freely on the map. And so we wanted to test those different combinations because um, the assumption was that maybe um, some uh, some of these variants are a little bit more tricky, um, but maybe they are getting aided when combined with different uh, maybe task based maps or interactivity. To jump into the results, um, this is a very summarized version of the results. Um, so for Uganda, and this is the plot is showing the success rate. I'm not sure if you see uh, very well the the, uh, the the numbers here, but this is the success rate by task based map and activity for Uganda. And here we see that um, between the task and the base map, map uh, styles, we don't see much difference. We see, of course, that um, there's a decrease in success rate for the third task. There was the sketching task and the map of street. So the street view, the more information dense uh, base map. But then when we look at the interactivity, we see uh, a huge difference. Um, well, it's not huge, but we see quite a bit of a step. So for the static uh, map, the, that's uh, the no panning zooming variant here, um, the success rate was higher, which makes sense because the user weren't able to do much with the map. And then uh, there was a decrease, um, quite a bit of a decrease, for the non-restricted version of, of the map. For Colombia, um, it looks a little bit different. Um, so for the task, we had much more variation. Um, so the success rate was much higher for the first type of task. There was identification of a, of a location. So kind of clicking on the map to identify a location. And then also the third task was um, much lower. There was the sketching. So there participants had to interact a little bit more to click on some buttons to, to uh, actually draw on the map. Then for the base map, there's this tendency towards the simple map. So a highlighted point of interest, uh, or where we highlighted a point of interest, but also had more context about the street network. And then for the interactivity, also, we also see a bit of a decrease towards the non-restricted degree of interactivity, but not, not as much as uh, for the Ugandan uh, experiment. We also ran a couple of regression models, um, and uh, I don't, I'm not showing this right now because there wasn't, there weren't, because what we wanted to do was we wanted to understand if there are other factors influencing the usability, uh, the success rate, for example. And uh, there was uh, not too much coming out of that. Um, so pharma demographics, for example, didn't play such a role here. This might also be because just like in the end, the pharma characteristics didn't differ much for these type of participants. So that might look completely different when, when having other types of participants in, in, this, in those experiments. Um, but in general, you can say that most of these participants weren't um, used to working much or at all with interactive maps, so with this type of interface. So we saw that for these um, users or for these participants, um, they would be aided by a reduced task complexity and restricted interactivity. There could be a bounding box or a setting map, uh, setting map um, and highlighting point of interest on the basement so they, are, they know right away where they are and uh, to kind of highlight um, the important points. Um, to conclude here, um, I was also talking in the beginning about user experience. Um, I'm not, I wasn't talking in the results about this because um, those typical user experience measures we applied, they didn't work quite well. So that um, generated quite a bit of response bias. So we had to exclude the, these data um, and we were only focusing on usability. That's something to look into in the future because it would be interesting. And again, thinking about long-term uh, participation to know um, how confident and comfortable uh, participants are when using these applications or these, these interfaces. Um, and in, in general, we can actually say, because there was kind of a question that we were asking, um, can farmers actually use these types of maps? And I would say, yes, they can, um, when taking into account those design decisions. Um, so this will help us refining in the future uh, interface design decisions. And, um, and I think this also um, gives us a good hint 
that uh, we need to test those different interfaces always and we have to go to the farmers and or to the end, end user in general to test those things okay thank you very much that's from my part i'm looking forward to answering questions okay thank you mona i will do a very very quick wrap up because we have just a few minutes and I, I sh there should be some time for questions so i think today we have seen three uh three digital tools, Stepwise app, the Shade tool, and the GeoPharma app. Uh, I think one, one lesson that we have learned from the COVID crisis is, at least we as scientists, uh, that these digital tools are very important for data collection when we cannot go to the field, like right now. But it's also very important for extension workers, digital tools to be used because they can also, like it's currently cannot access or go to farms uh, in times uh, where they are restricted mobility so so we also know that sharing information is crucial for farmers because they want to take their decisions by their own and they want to share the experience and learn from other farmers so this is also a very important outcome and i would also say one final comment from my side uh, which should be some discussion is we have seen that there are already many tools and apps out there so you know there are others like odk interactive voice response calls and many others just to mention a few of them and i think in the future what will become very important and i think diana mentioned it at the end of her of her presentation we need to, to find a way how these different apps can talk to each other how to make them interoperable because we cannot uh, ask the farmer to access 10 different tools or so this is not feasible in the future so i think this is the discussion for the next steps and I had the discussion with Sarah and I did him already so we, we are thinking about how we can combine these different tools and methodologies so that the farmer will get uh, and hopefully using what Mona has, has learned from her from her usability studies and, and provide to the farmer the best way to access all these functionalities and tools. So now I hand over to, to Maria so to start maybe there are some questions. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah, Diana, Mona, and Anton for introducing us to your work. I will begin by looking at the questions. Um, so Diana has already answered a few questions. Um, she's already wrote them down in the Q&A box. Um, but we do have some other couple of questions. So Paul Benjamin asks, why don't you make other applications for selling their coffee or how they know their coffee is good and quality based or smartphones applications? Uh, to respond to this question, yeah, I think the, the, the private sector is, um, should, should, so the coffee buyers that are, uh, they need quality coffee, so they should provide the right uh, recommendation for farmers. So it's part of, of digital extension that is, I would say it's, it's, it's just beginning, uh, but you are right. It's very important that in, for a digital extension, we can, we can combine data-driven agronomy, so really make the best recommendations out of data and translate them to real recommendations for farmers so that they can improve their quality and they know why they are not getting the right quality, for example. And, th and this should go also this, uh, knowledge sharing channels that could be private sector obviously on the extension part on the, uh, the coffee buyers but obviously research as we have seen from Sarah's and Diana's example they have a lot to contribute to improve farmers um, uh, coffee productivity and and I would say there is this third uh, channel like between farmers they can also learn a lot from each other. Perfect thank you Anton. We have a question now from Rita Mani, she asks, what is the benefit for the farmers of using Y-Step? Yes, uh, maybe I can respond. I think she meant uh, the stepwise application. So as I explained, um, most of our farmers are resource constrained. They don't have enough resources to be able to implement all the climate smart agricultural technology. So through the stepwise approach, <laughs> we've sort of broken down the whole, the, the whole bundle of practices because we have around, let's say 14, 15 practices and farmers were implementing this haphazardly without knowing which step goes first and how can we, which practices we can start with, with minimal investment. So with a stepwise application or with a stepwise approach, we've broken down those practices through 
um, collaboration with private and public sector partners through farmer involvement, through extension, extension workers. We've had a lot of workshops and then we've been able to develop um, different package, practice, um, small, small packages of that practices so that even as the most resource constrained farmer knows that he can implement the most basic practices and still get very good yields as opposed to mixing different practices and not realizing the yield benefit. So the farmers are able to move step by step until they get to the highest level of investment where they get the highest um, yield and income from their coffee fields. So it's just to guide farmers to go step by step. Can I also just make a comment there? One of the one of the examples that um, that we often give is is a lot of private sector um, will will look at giving farmers fertilizer, for instance. But if the farmer isn't weeding his coffee, then all that fertilizer is going to do is feed the weeds. So by taking those farmers through that step-by-step -step process, it also, it helps them understand the value at each step and the interconnectivity of, of, of the different practices. Um, and, and that is why it's, it's such a, it's, I mean, it's such a common sense model, right? But it's because of that, it, it's something that is easily understood. Once the farmer has been through that process, they will continue to work that way. They don't need to keep being trained. They, they don't need us to keep coming back and, and training. They, they will have learned the value of each process and they will be able to see the increased outputs, the increased quality and the increased coffee uh, quantities. So it's, it's a very practical approach that farmers can, can very easily understand and continue to, to, to implement beyond, long beyond a project. I was on mute, sorry. Thank you, Sarah. Next question is from Ambika. Is it a free app? So I think um, she was, um, she asked this question when Anton was um, presenting, if I'm not wrong. So the question is which app? Is, it a free app? Uh, is this a question for all panelists? So I think it's more into your side, um, Anton. Can you, can you repeat the question, please? Is it a free app, the GeoFarmer app? Yes, it's a, it's a free app, uh, but let's say if you want to manage your own channel, uh, we need to authorize it. We do it for farmers groups, it's not, a, but so let's say the moderator view, which is the more complex role of creating service and doing, so it needs some training. That's why we are not, uh, Keeping the moderator role free, but the farmer's role is always free. Perfect. So we have two questions coming up, and I think these are our final questions so we can finalize the webinar. So for Diana, this question is for you from Luma Hamdi. Um, could we use it in other regions that are completely different from Uganda climate? So, okay, yeah. So as I explained, the current information that we have in the tools is context specific, but we hope to populate the tools. So the web-based platform is also going to be populated with data from other, uh, other countries. We already have, I think, uh, um, information from other countries. So specifically, the smartphone mobile application is for Uganda because we have only Uganda data in the tool, but it can still be populated with information from other countries and other regions of the world. So we will work maybe through working with our different CGIR partners. Of course, we are already working with CIRAD. We hope that we will populate those tools and include information from other parts of the world. Perfect. Thank you, Dana. Um, so right. this is a question for all of the panelists. So how are these projects funded operationally? So I can start. So as, as I said, one of the beginning slides, so we have funded the development of GeoFarmers through several funding, several projects like until now, since 2013. And so we have it now uh, in, a, in a productive version and we just need to pay server maintenance. So this is not, so we pay it out of the institution right now. Uh, 
and once we we get um, next fundings we're gonna develop new modules so but the basic modules that have already been developed they will keep they will be online forever as long as we have the basic funding for the hardware maintenance which is not very high but at least uh, we don't need necessarily uh, ongoing funding for uh, keeping it online. Thank you, Anton. So Janet Molina asks, what is or will be the business model to maintain or scale up the app? So maybe if you guys can go into detail a bit about that. So I can say something um, about that and, and actually on the last question, funding. So, um, like Anton said, I mean, there's been multiple streams of funding from different donors. Um, in Uganda, we've worked very closely with private sector who in some cases have co-funded some of the activities um, or are continuing to fund some of our field-based activities. Um, moving forward, as we, as we move into a scaling phase, then, then all of these tools and approaches are, are, are open source. So, so essentially what we, we are doing in the scaling phase is encouraging private sector investment now to take on these technologies so that they don't have to be reliant on donor funding. Um, so part of our scaling strategy in Uganda is about how we work with private sector to take on these technologies now. We can still provide backing, backup and support and mentoring, for instance. We would still hope to be able to do our research alongside of the scaling, because obviously, as a research institute, we want to keep learning, we want to keep collecting this data, sharing it, um, and, and so that we can keep improving those tools. But for the most part, we're looking at, at, at private sector scaling so that um, yeah, we can be less reliant on, on donor funding. And yes, I'm hoping to work much more with SEAT and um, new ways of scaling. <laughs> yeah, me too. It's, it's, it's called the alliance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Rita Manik asks, um, this question is for any presenter. Have you evaluated whether the production was increased in quantity or quality using the apps? Uh, well, I can say in Uganda, we've definitely, looking at the stepwise approach, the application of the stepwise approach, we've seen uh, up to 73% increased yield gains of, of coffee for coffee farmers uh, where we've been working with Olam in Mount Elgin. Um, you know, the challenge of attributing something solely to the app as opposed to training and mentoring and backstopping and all of the other activities that, that go on, um, we haven't yet been able to, to hone in. And part of our scaling, um, we'll be looking at how do we do that? How do we now monitor um, the role of, of all of these ac different activities to, and how do they contribute to that percentage gain? Um, attribution is always, is always a challenge. Um, but yes, we will, we will be looking much more. And as we expand our, our Stepwise app and link it to mobile applications, so we can, we can link the extension um, technical app to the, the, the farmers themselves, hopefully we will be able to now start to, to record the farmer interactions um, and, and we'll be able to get a better sense then of, of of how they're using the apps and how, how the information is, is impacting on their decision making. Yeah, it's the same for us, for GeoPharma. So what we did, we used the app basically to, to show evidence, um, what's the effect of climate smart agriculture practices in these climate smart villages, but it's not because of the app. So it's just a more efficient way or more cost efficient way to get these indicators and this M&E done instead of uh, maybe doing it in traditional workshops and other ways of collecting this information so you get higher numbers, faster feedback and, and more data for monitoring. So it's, it's more this as the, the benefit for the farmer is coming from the climate smart agriculture practice and not from the, from the app in this case. Thank you, Anton. And we have one last question to finalize our webinar from Anand Krishna. Can the GeoFarmer app be used to present information in other languages? 
Uh, yes, so the basic language of Geopharma is English. We have translated the, um, the interface so far into French, it Italian, Spanish, and Vietnamese. So it's an, so we can, if there is a, a real need uh, for a specific language, we can implement a new language fairly quickly. Uh, but obviously all the, the content you put, uh, even the, the, let's say the interface language is English, you can put the, the content to the app in any language. So you can type your questions in any language and as far as the others can understand the language, they can respond. So it's, it's like the interface language, you have four until now, and you can add simple a new one. And the content language is the language that the user uses. And to finalize, is the app available in Google Play? Uh, we are using uh, progressive web apps, which means it's platform independent. So it's, it's one basic source code that you can run in any browser. So it works on your desktop, you know, any mobile phone, iPhone, Android. So it's just one application for all these different platforms. Once we have a stable version, like finalized, we can make a copy and, and put it to the Play Store, but it's not in the Play Store until now because we're still yeah, I'm kind of uh, waiting if we do more changes or, <laughs> or it's really finished. So it's not in the Play Store right now. And can it work offline if it's a web app? Uh, yes, you, a user can subscribe to a channel and activate a synchronization function and then all, this da all the data is synchronized to his, his cell phone and then you can work offline. This works not for all functionalities, it works especially for the service and it's not working for the discussions because this is like more depending on, on real time discussion. So it's working for the service and for some other functionalities, but it's not working for the live discussion. Okay, we have one question. I know we have to finalize this webinar, but Jose Madrigal asks, what's the precision, the, what is the precision, the climatic information? What is the precision of the climatic information? The prediction, the precision of the climatic information. So in the case of Geopharma, so it's a, it's a framework app for two-way communication. So basically the content is coming from the user or from one of the users in a channel. So there's, we, have, we haven't done specific climate information there. So this would be my response. There we go. Thank you all for joining us. Um, we are going to now end this webinar. Um, remember that the link to the recording will be shared through the social media channels and web page of the CGIR platform for Big Data and Agriculture and the YouTube channel of the platform. Um, thank you all to our panelists and to our attendees. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thank you as well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.